How's it? Well, actually, good afternoon, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, today I want to talk about climate change, actually. Um, if you've been living under a rock, you might not have seen, but the Amazon rainforest is burning at the moment. Um, and as one of my favorite YouTubers, Hank Green, said, the Amazon actually isn't burning, but it's being burnt by loggers, farmers, and agriculture enthusiasts um, in Brazil. And I wanted to take a more measured approach today because I've been thinking a lot about it and the way climate change is pursued is... Um, hello, dog. The way climate change is viewed in current society um, and kind of the negatives and positives surrounding discussing it. And so the first thing I want to mention is that obviously climate change is bad and we need to do as much as possible to mitigate the dangers of global warming and to do as much as possible to save as much of the biodiversity and plant life and animal life on the planet that we can because it's the only planet we've got. Um, but equally so, I want to talk about how in the modern day world with the modern day amenities and you know all the modern day luxuries that we have, you can't just as easily separate your modern lifestyle and global warming as much as you think you can. Um, I see this especially with the blame on big corporations for global warming. Obviously big businesses and that do a lot of unsavory environmental things that cause damage to the environment. But also, you know, I'm filming this on a GoPro. This GoPro had to be produced somewhere. Rare earth metals had to be mined in an open cast mine and somewhere to get the silicon and that that went into this camera. You know, um, dirty petrol was used to ship this camera over to me. And globalization has caused you know, massive development around the world and that with goods and services and that being shared. And if you're a part of the modern day world in the economy, you're inextricably linked to that global network of dirty energy and of global warming. And it's not as easy to put the blame on a single corporation or a single bad invention and say they are responsible for the majority of global warming when we are all linked and responsible. And so that brings us to the current issue at hand, the Amazon rainforest. There's a whole lot of fires burning there at the moment. These fires aren't caused by natural causes. They're caused by farmers, um, agriculture enthusiasts, and illegal loggers um, burning down trees and swaths of rainforest to make way for grass and cattle and more economically viable farming uh, methods than just rainforest. Because unfortunately, in our world economy, rainforest doesn't value much. It doesn't mean a lot of money. It doesn't equate to much money in um, taxpayers' back pockets. Rainforests are great for human health and for the environment and that, but they're not great for money. And unfortunately, in a third world country like Brazil, um, they need all the money they can get. And so it naturally makes sense to start logging um, more parts of the rainforest to make, more, mo make way for more agriculture and to make way for more economic developments. And very easily we can demonize Brazil and say that's terrible they must save the environment you know how can they be doing this and that but also a lot of the industrialized nations in the world have done it America has chopped down most of their forests as Hank Green pointed out in his video um, Britain leveled most of their natural wildlife uh, during the industrial revolution and they polluted the earth for literally what a hundred years during the, the steam era and that and that's why a lot of those northern hemisphere countries are, as they are today, world powers and are so rich and wealthy and so industrialized is because they use their natural resources and fossil fuels to build their economy up and to build up their development. And so how can we, in 2019, demonize Brazil for doing this when they're just copying what everyone else has already done? And it's a problem as well because the, the Amazon rainforest provides most of the oxygen and provides most of the CO2 scrubbing for the entire planet, but it resides in one country. And that country doesn't get any economic development from it, as I learned in Hank Green's excellent video, the link for which is in the description, by the way. But Brazil doesn't get any economic um, benefits from having the Amazon rainforest there. And with the rise of a new nationalist president in there, he's taken a very much liking to repealing climate change law and um, cutting down forests just because it's good for the economy. And while the world shrieks and uh, demonizes him and that, you also have to see it from his perspective, you know? He's just following what the rest of the world has already done and trying to, you know, make a better Brazil, even though it will eventually make Brazil hotter by cutting down rainforests and make it more unpleasant to live there. You know, he's just trying to do the best for Brazil. And it's part of the problem why I have a problem with nationalism and Trump, you know, repealing the G20 climate summit and Obama's climate change policies and that, because we live in a global world, really, despite the lines in the sand that we've drawn and called them countries. You know, we all live on the same planet. We all breathe the same air. And unfortunately, what some countries do by nationalist policies affects all of us, affects the environment around all of us. 
And it's a big problem because we're still seeing in these nationalist agendas when we're a real global economy. That's why I like being a teenager as I am right now. I'm almost not a teenager anymore, actually. But um, I like being part of the internet and a global community and global memes and jokes and, you know, rising together for causes and, you know, um, condemning certain things and building a better future together. You know, all the internet and that is online, it's global. Everyone is together. Everyone is the same. You know, my best friend and there lives in Chicago, 16,000 kilometers away. I still feel as close to him as he was when he lived next door to me. Um, and so I love being a part of that global culture. And unfortunately, I don't see a huge amount of collaboration in politics and economies and countries and that in saving the planet and getting together for things. Because unfortunately, you know, you've got to look after your own first. You've got to look after your own country, your own family first. And I hope that my generation can be the generation to build up that global sense of community and that global responsibility and solve, solve global problems together. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but we can stop global warming today. We can end climate change right here. Hello, dog. I'm trying to talk to them about biodiversity and the climate and you're interrupting me. No. We can end climate change today by shutting down all our factories, switching off all our power plants and going back and living in the stone ages. We can do it. We can save the world today. But at the very end of the day, it doesn't matter because the earth's going to be wiped out eventually. If not, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, there's an asteroid whizzing past Earth at a really close couple of th uh, hundred thousand kilometers. Um, if that thing strikes Earth, we're finished. I just finished listening to a book called The Counting Stars. Um, it's a book about an alternate history of the space race um, when a, a meteorite slams into the Earth in the 1950s, destroying most of Washington and causing a, a runaway greenhouse effect that eventually warms the Earth and um, makes the Earth unlivable for all life. And that is a very real possibility. If a big enough asteroid hits us, we're finished, just like the dinosaurs. Um, and it's only by some miracle that some little tiny rat or mammal managed to survive that dinosaur extinction event. And so the end of the world is really possible in the next hundred, couple thousand years. And so humans definitely have a responsibility as one of the smartest creatures on the planet to save the rich biosphere and biodiversity that we have. And we need to go out into space to do that. And unfortunately, to do that, we need energy and we need industrialized society. So we want to save the planet, absolutely. But we also have to balance that with the beauty and simplifications and the comforts and the real benefits of a modern day industrialized society. Um, and it's a very complex problem that I think is often oversimplified in the media. You know, we demonize. Um, climate change and global warming because it's bad and modern lifestyle is bad and eating meat is bad and technology and that is bad because it's killing the environment and you know causing smoke and that is bad and you know causing fires and uh, destroying the ecosystem is bad but also none of us want to give up our first world comforts and I don't advocate giving up our first world comforts either because at the very end of the day the earth will eventually cease to exist one day we'll get hit by an asteroid um, the heat death of the universe will occur, or the sun will expand and explode and destroy our entire solar system, the Earth is eventually going to be gone, never more. Um, and so animal life and human life and everything on the Earth will eventually perish. But it doesn't have to. Human beings have the intelligence and the resources and the technology and the skills to one day get us off planet and to take biodiversity and ecology and um, all the wonderful things on Earth over to other planets and to transport all the amazing things that we have on Earth elsewhere in the galaxy and even the whole observable universe. And I want to argue today that it is, it is more important to focus on that, that one day ultimate getting human, human life and, planet and plant life and animal life off the planet Earth and you know, spreading into the galaxy than it is saving every single species and saving our planet completely. Because there's no point if we save our entire environment and our planet only to never advance as a species, to never get into space, to never push forward in our development, um, and to just stay on this earth and perish here with it. Because we might be the only intelligent species in the universe. There's a slim chance that we might be the only intelligent species to ever arise in the entire universe. And that is worth preserving. That is something incredibly special and rare that is worth, unfortunately, losing some biodiversity, in my opinion. And so I love the environment. I love nature. You know, I love being outside. I hate it when I have to stay in my varsity room for too long. But it's equally important to balance human ambition 
with saving the planet. And I think a lot of people get that wrong nowadays. And so that brings me to my next point. Um, since we're a global economy, everyone's commenting on this Amazon rainforest issue at the moment and <laughs> the old phrase keyboard activism comes to mind. Everyone's berating Brazil on that for doing the things that they're currently doing with the rainforests. But I find it very frustrating to see, um, you know, myself included, I'm a part of this, but to see people um, blame certain people for polluting the environment and that and blame people for hurting the environment but still continuing to live the lifestyles that they do without any kind of remorse, you know? Driving a big fat petrol car is fucking terrible for the environment. We've got a diesel car as well, you know? Um, you know, eating meat is really bad in that, but it's really hard to change the entire population's um, move away from meat, a meat-based diet just because it's so protein rich and because it's so tasty and because it's what everyone is so used to in culture and tradition, which is also an important part of uh, human lifestyle to preserve that culture and that, um, that rich diversity of culture. Equally so, um, a lot of vegan food, you know, like the fancier vegan food, like that imported, you know, I don't know, French kale salad that you had imported from Portugal or whatever, that came over to our country on a dirty petrol aeroplane. And that also had a massive impact on the environment. You know, Woolworths, as great a shopping uh, supermarket brand as they are, they also, you know, use petrol cars to deliver, to deliver their produce, you know. They also use a bit of factory farming occasionally. You know, they also have to run electricity to keep the lights on their stores. On that, electricity comes from coal. You know, everything is interconnected, and it's such a complex, um, difficult problem, energy and climate change and the environment. And I think it's far too often simplified to eating meat is bad. You know, coal energy is bad, and this is good, and that's okay, and that's not. And so I think we really do need to think about it a lot more. Before you go out and post, you know, things about the rainforest is burning, we need to save the trees, the planet, and that, you know, realize it's often a lot more difficult to do than it might initially seem. It's very difficult to shut down an entire international system of trade without the entire world collapsing into chaos and that, because no one wants that. You know, the, the human experience, the human consciousness, the human, um, human life is so rich and biodiverse and amazing and incredible and we want to keep it going for as long as possible. You know, human culture is an incredible thing. And we want to advance and explore the galaxy and do as, ama as many amazing things as possible as we can. And unfortunately, some things need to suffer for that, you know. We have, we, to get to, into space, we need rockets. Rockets are going to pollute the environment a bit. Same thing, you know. To get to where we are now with our current brain capacity and our current um, master status of the environment we had to kill off a lot of animals in the past and we had to eat them and we got stronger because of it we developed fire um, we built cities to become safer out of cities came art and science and technology but also when we made cities we cut down trees and forests and killed off some biodiversity and it's a very complex problem and the engineer in me or the engineering student at least wants to very often not think about ideal societies and ideal utopias where we don't eat any animals and we have a completely zero carbon footprint on the planet. I believe we can get there one day. Um, you know, I don't like to believe in those ideal, those ideal visions so much as what do we have in the world right now? What's a practical consideration for improving the environment right now? What are the trade-offs, that the difficult choices that we have to make where we leave behind some animal biodiversity and some of our nature and some of our beautiful earth in order to get that industrialized future of humanity and future of biodiversity into the solar system and into the galaxy, you know? There's these trade-offs and we really do need to think about them because veganism and saving the planet is great in theory, but it's theory and it's very difficult to implement it practically. And I'd like for people to think about this more before they go posting on the internet. That's also why I believe in in vitro meat so much. In vitro meat is uh, meat grown in a test tube from animal stem cells. It uses a lot less energy than traditional farming methods. The animal is never actually alive because it's just grown from a single cell up into a big patty and then you can put it on your grill and have an amazing beef burger that was never actually alive. Um, it uses a lot less water. It doesn't um, cut down rainforests and that to make way for grain, which is then fed to cows and then you cut up your cow and whatever. Um, so in vitro meat is a real practical consideration for a world that still eats meat. And that's why I'm a real big fan of it because um, veganism is great, but it, I think it's very difficult, as most vegans will agree with me, to even get people to consider seriously not eating meat because it's such a part of our culture and our humanity. And it's just so normal nowadays and it's so cheap. Um, but one day when in vitro meat is cheaper than factory farmed meat and you can go get a steak, it was never actually alive, 
people will follow the money. I mean, that's the same reason why electric car subsidies have worked in Norway. Everyone there drives a Tesla, as my sister and I happily pointed out to each other countless times a day when we were there on holiday last time, uh, last year. Um, people drive Teslas there because it's economically feasible. It makes sense. It saves you money. Um, and that's a really great way for governments. That's how governments should be addressing climate change with climate policies, with uh, green energy subsidies, you know, with tariffs on meat, uh, high import duties on expensive um, products and oil. A quick side note as well on the science of climate change. Um, climate change is mostly driven by CO2 emissions. It's also driven by methane emissions. And so the rainforest argument, by cutting down trees, we cut down the Earth's ability to absorb CO2 and release more oxygen, thereby increasing the greenhouse effect by releasing more um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere which traps sunlight when it hits the earth and heats up the earth slowly and slowly decreases the amount of biodiversity in the world because the temperatures increase and that disrupts a whole lot of natural ecosystems and that because they're not used to the change in temperature and eventually like in the Counting Stars book that I read the greenhouse effect runs away with itself and heats the earth so much that the oceans eventually boil and that kills off everything as you might imagine um, but different greenhouse gases have different effects on the planet. Methane is a lot worse for the planet than CO2 is, but there's a lot less methane being produced by humans, animals, agriculture, and that. Um, if you look at this graph over here from Our World in Data, a great site, you really must go check it out. Um, you can see that methane is a much smaller percentage of the greenhouse emissions that cause climate change, but methane is 28 times more powerful than CO2. And so it comes down to, you know, Unfortunately, we need to figure out what is the most efficient way to mitigate climate change, not what is the best ideal way to mitigate climate change, because we can't do everything. And so it would be great to shut down all our um, meat production, all our animal products, stop clearing rainforests and that for agriculture and just eat veggies all ourselves. But coal is a filthy resource. And if we can stop all coal production and instead move to renewable energy, um, that will have a much bigger impact on the planet than, say, reducing the amount of meat that people eat. And so it's important to look at the data when considering these big um, world-changing issues that we're talking about. Because one is very difficult and very hard to do. Sorry, they're both very difficult and very hard to do. But one has a much bigger and outsized impact on the earth at the end of the day. And it's important to remember that we're not going to be able to save everything. We can't. There's no perfect solution. We just have to have the best we can. And people's minds are difficult to change it's difficult to get climate change policies enacted and if we have to choose between limiting agriculture production and methane emissions or limiting coal and co2 emissions we should reduce the co2 emissions first because it's it has a much worse impact on the planet because there's so much more co2 in the atmosphere and coal production produces so much more co2 also on a note of energy production um i've learned quite a lot doing my engineering degree now from the electrical engineering side of things with regards to nuclear energy and coal energy. So we have this thing called base energy, which is the huge amount of energy that a power grid has to work with during the day and during the night. Um, and then a lot of energy systems at the moment, power grids and that, have coal as their main bottom base load energy, which provides the core and the main drive of energy to households. And then on top of that, you have things topping up that energy supply, like renewable energy, like wind energy, like wave, geothermal, uh, nuclear energy and that. And so we can, in the future, run everything off renewable energy. It's just very difficult to do because at night time, there's no sun. And yeah, there's wind and that, but it's unfortunately very hard to store electricity. And people are working on flow batteries, and Elon Musk is working on battery uh, storage technologies and that. But to build up that amount of battery storage technologies to store renewables that we can't produce during the night and at times when we don't have wind and when we don't have sun, um, is very difficult. That's why coal has lasted for as long as it has, because we can burn it any time of the day and whenever we need it. But with battery storage technologies, renewables can eventually come to the forefront. But it's just very inefficient. Um, the amount of sun that hits a solar panel that actually gets converted to usable energy is something laughably low. Like, we're getting better, but I believe a few years ago it was around 10%. Um, and whereas coal, it's like something much higher. And it's unfortunately very difficult to get the same amount of energy out of the sun that we get on a solar panel than we get from a piece of coal. But we're getting there. We're getting there slowly. But yeah, thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something. I learned some things researching it. And I really hope you remember in future that... It's very difficult to balance human ambition and practical considerations with moving forward with the human species and 
the environment and the world. And unfortunately, we're going to have to make some trade-offs in the future. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.